Okay. Um, welcome back to the session. We will try and resume now with the first talk uh, being given by Javier, Javier Maldon, who is um, permanent, um, a, a member of the IA of the IA. So we'll be talking about the reproduci reproducibility in the SK challenges and uh, how to make um, one's publication more reproduci reproducible. Okay, thank you, Amidou. So yeah, I will talk uh, about reproducibility and specific, specifically on the practical side on how or what things could you do to improve your reproducibility of the analysis you are doing. So I can adapt a little bit the talk and I would like to know how many of you are uh, PhD researchers, or so pre-docs, well, can you raise your hand, please? So in remotely also you maybe raise your hands, okay, a few, who are postdocs, okay. And who are, well, let's let's say it, who was doing research when Python was created? Like in the in the 90s or so. Can you raise your hands? Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, good. And uh, yes, the last question. Uh, who are you, who, who among you have used the uh, GitHub or GitLab or similar repositories called repositories or have interacted with repositories, created uh, things like that? Okay, most of you. Okay, I will I will shorten that part. Okay, so let's let's start. And this is you. You are a researcher, and you are going to to do your uh, analysis of very interesting star or a very interesting object, a galaxy or object in general. And here is your collaborator or your supervisor or whoever you want, and is showing you a new methodology that he invented. Uh, he has some analysis tools. And, and he said, okay, you can use it. Do, do it for your research. Uh, analyze the data from this object and see what, what we can do with it. So you start playing with this new analysis tool, but you see that there is a problem here because it's manual, okay? You need to, you need to touch buttons, you need to drive it, you need to, um, uh, to find a place, suitable place to run it, okay? So there are a few things that you need to do manually. You have to open the door. Many things need to be done manually. So. You work on this object and after six months, one year, you do all the effort and then you finally get your results. Here is the paper that you have uh, prepared and all this water is uh, sweat and tears from all the effort that you put into this object. But the results are nice. So you go back to your collaborator and you say, look what I found. Now the paper is, is dry again. <laughs> you saw, and, and then your collaborator say, wow, this is amazing. This result is really, really interesting. But this is only one object. We should do more objects, maybe a hundred objects. And then he's very excited and this can be a revolution in your field. We need to do, and, and you start seeing the, your face, uh, worrying face, because everything that you did was manually. And then he said, no, 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 this is very, very important. Not a hundred objects, no, a thousand objects. And then this is your face, of course, because uh, you are in trouble because many of the things you, you did with this tool was manual. Okay. so. What I want to, to, to transfer is that now you are a researcher, but in the future, you will probably also be a researcher or you will work in other, in other fields. And the things that you do now, um, you will not do completely new things all the time. You will build upon what you already did and you will improve it. You will in increase it, expand it and improve it in general. So what your career can benefit from the work that you do now to make all these analyses as reproducible as possible uh, because it will help uh, the, the work that you did, you don't need to repeat it again. You can expand on it. Okay, that's that's one of the main things of uh, reproducibility as I see it. So the importance, uh, it, the importance is to give the full story of the science that you are doing. So uh, what you did and why usually goes into the paper, you explain why you did things and, and what you did, the documentation, the readme files, but then there's how you did it actually, the, the, the methodology, the actual methodology, the actual implementation. And that is a combination of the software, the code, the scripts you use, the data, all that. You also need to tell that story. It's not only what you did, it's also how you did it. And of course, if you do all this and you deliver the full story, you will deliver robust, reliable, trustful science and open science benefits the research community, the society, everything. This is very nice, very beautiful. It's, it's an, our aspiration. But there is a big but. Doing full end-to-end -end automatic 
reproducibility is hard and you need to understand that very clearly. It's, you need to be realistic. It's a complex process. There are many different um, parts, moving parts, working together to produce a final result, a final paper, for example, or a series of papers or whatever. And this is there are, there is, there are files, scripts, data, configuration files, the software, dependencies, so software versions. You need to think of the purpose, what you want to do, and also the skills you have. Not everyone, uh, not all of us, we are scientists, we are not computing, uh, computer scientists or software engineers. So all these things take time and uh, they are difficult. I recommend you that you go step by step, you evaluate your own skills, learn what you need to learn, and then start applying as much reproducibility as you can. Okay, but this is a progress, it's a process. Don't start one day from now, I will be full reproducible. That normally that doesn't happen. It takes time and it takes work. So define your scope. Uh, incremental progress is better than frustration. So you can, you can think who is going to reproduce my research? Potentially all future generations of scientists that will ever exist may want to reproduce your, your research. But if you're realistic, start by the beginning, do it for yourself. And particular for your future self, your future self will be the most the people that the, the person that will be most uh, benefit by the by reproducibility. So first of all, do it for yourself because you like science, because you like to do things in the world in a good way, and because it will be useful for you. Uh, yeah, Rachel also mentioned yesterday that not only for your research, some of these skills and abilities to work with software to reproduce uh, things, to work with workflows that automatically do things. Uh, it, it, uh, it's very tra um, transferable. It's not only for research, but also if some of you work in, in industry, this will also be a, a very good skill for, for industry. Then you can also do it for your collaborators because it's nice to collaborate with other people and share information. You can do for paper referees that maybe a referee says, I don't understand how you, do, you did this. I want to know more details. And you can then send your reproducible analysis, uh, share it in Binder, for example, you will see this afternoon, and the referee will be happy to see the actual works. Also for the community in your field, or also for everyone, present and future. But you need to define your scope. Okay, a reproducible paper, it has very few components. It's, it's not, it can be very complicated, as I said, when you do full end-to-end -end automatic reproducibility, so one button and you have everything, but it doesn't need to be uh, that, at least at this stage, so th that can be an aspiration for, for when you are ready to do that. Uh, so you need location instructions on how to access the raw data, where things are located, how to download them, uh, what's in there, etc. You need explicit definition of software used, and this is very important because things broke. If you wrote a Python code a few years ago with Python 2, and you run it now with Python 3, it will not work, and this happens with any kind of code. In the future, it will mostly, most likely always have some problem running uh, all code. So if you don't define, I mean, if you don't define explicitly which versions were used. And then you have the analysis, the code, the scripts that you used, not only the code, but also the, the order in which you execute the code. This needs to happen first and then this and then that, okay? All that usually needs some kind of documentation, some, some information that is in the uh, somewhere and explains uh, how all this is articulated. Um, let's see one example. I want to show you explicitly one example. It's, it's not a, I would say, it's not a the perfect, fully reproducible paper, but it's a paper that you can reproduce. And it's simple, but it, I think it does what uh, needs to be done. Uh, and that's that's what we are <laughs> looking for. So it has a repository. It's important to keep, we will talk later about um, keeping everything in some version control repository. So they have this repository associated with a paper. There is a readme file with information about the paper, where, what they are doing, the software. Uh, the software requirements are simply detailed in this environment YAML file. Yesterday with the, in the conda session you saw, probably you cannot see anything here. Uh, they just defined, uh, I used Panda version 1.2, NumPy 119. They have the software explicitly um, listed here. And then they have content data, where the data are located, how to access it, figures, the figures of the paper, notebooks, and additional. So if you go, for example, to the notebooks folder, it's in the same repository, you have here a lot of ePython notebooks and HTML files. They have both, just to, if you want to explore in one or, or the other format. And they have steps, step one, step two, a clean sample. Step three, obtain SED. 
So you have all the, and, and then if you open one of these uh, Python notebooks, you can see what happened in that step, that particular step. Uh, notebooks are nice. Uh, yesterday, you also heard more, uh, about uh, them because you can combine explanations of what you are doing with the act actual implementation. I read the table this way, exactly this way. And then you see also the outputs. So you, you have the combination of many different elements that you can you can see and anyone like us now are looking into this, this result. A few more things that you would need. Uh, here it's called additionals, but I think this is almost, almost the most important part of the of this repository, there is a step-by-step -step markdown file in which there is a table of contents uh, with all the description, brief description of all these steps. Here I create the database sample. Here I clean the safer, the safer sample. And this step produces figure one of the paper. So everything is linked. And you, if you're reading the paper, you come here and you say, okay, I want to know what how this part of the paper was done. You come here and probably you will find it very easily. And then this points to the notebooks so do you get the details? And I think this, this is a reproducible paper. Someone understands what is the software, what they did, the order, and they have the basic ingredients, okay? It may not, uh, for example, it doesn't deploy uh, all the software automatically. You have to do it manually. Okay, that's a step that you can do further in the future when you are able to do that. But at least this, with this, anyone can reproduce what they or understand at least what they did. And if they put some effort on installing the software, they can also, reproduce it. In fact, with the um, the link to binder, if you click in binder, it's here in the, in the intro, if you click the binder link, it takes some minutes, there is a virtual machine that is automatically created and you have the environment and you can run uh, all the notebooks. So this is a clear example of how to how to do things. Okay. Um, oops. And I think, uh, as I said, depending on your skills, I think this is something that almost everyone should be able to do with not too much effort. Uh, still, there is effort, of course. There is an, uh, it's more complicated than just to deliver to the, uh, to the public the paper. It's more work, but I think it's feasible to do that. So where to start? How to do this? Get routines. I think routines are very important when you are doing reproducibility. First, document everything you do. Write in readme files. You can have a readme file in each directory that you have and explain why you created that, where the data come from, what are you doing, why is this here? And this is for you. In one year, you most likely will not um, remember exactly everything, all the decisions that you made while working on this. So this will help you remind, okay, I did this because that, or I tried these five solutions, they don't, didn't work, but this one worked. You, in one year, don't have to repeat the five uh, failing solutions again. Use plain text. Um, uh, collaborative tools like Google Docs or things like that are very useful, but when you're documenting things, it's better to use plain text that you are completely sure that you will be able to, to read in the future. And Markdown is specifically a good, very nice uh, format, a syntax that uh, allows you to read in plain text, but also render in as HTML or PDFs, or uh, it's, it's very friendly. Use uh, online repositories like GitHub. Use version control like Git. This is another warning. Git is, is a world itself. It's, it can be very complicated, but it can also be very useful if you use it the, the right way. So I would say at least make the effort to, to learn the basics. The very basics are, are easy. We have, I have resources at the end with very short um, tutorials on how to use the basics. Add a file, commit, push, that's it. It's, it's what you need to start. Uh, with GitHub, you can work directly in the web, but it's better if you have Git, especially if you're doing analysis. Be explicit uh, with the software you use, we have said, and notebooks are, uh, can help with collaboration and with sharing, sharing your, communicating your, your results and what you are doing. Okay, this is the part, because most of you have already touched uh, GitHub, this will be very fast. Uh, if you have questions, I, we can talk uh, later also. The idea of these online repositories, and in particular GitHub, but it can be many other, is that you are working here and you do a piece of analysis, a notebook, a whatever, some plots, some, some analysis in general, and then you get very nice results and you discover the shadow of black holes or the center of the Milky Way. And then you want to share this analysis to be verified by your collaborators. What was done sometime before was, okay, I will email this, this piece of code or copy directly or the file, something like that. If you do this, I can almost guarantee that at some point you will have problems. 
the versions will not are not synchronized, so someone will change something, so well, someone will not find the right version, and it's a mess. Don't use this. Always use some centralized server. It can be a, a cloud, it can be maybe in your institute or GitHub or whatever. Share it through the cloud so everyone can uh, get these files. And most importantly, they, they can work on this. They can give feedback directly to the files so everything is synchronized among all the collaborators. That's why it's it's important. The, the final purpose is this, these things, the GitHub, etc., are collaborative platforms. It's social coding. Basically, maybe there is someone in your group that has very good ideas, other has very good skills in analysis, another one in interpreting data. So collaborating and adding all this information together and synchronized is, is very useful. Basic ingredients, well, this is a repository. We have already seen one, so uh, it can render files. We have seen that we can render um, not notebooks, uh, Python notebooks in directly, but also CSV, Markdown. I've already said that Markdown is a very good uh, format because you have plain text, but if needed, it can be rendered with some structure, which makes it, uh, you can also put plots, animated GIFs, anything like that. The readme file, as I said, is very important. In particular, there is the readme file in the in the in the main um, directory of the repositories, where here you usually describe what is this, who is it for, uh, put instructions where the files are, the project information, all that. I think it's important to have it. Uh, you by default have commit history, so all the changes that you've done are stored, and you don't need to create versions version one, version two, version three. Uh, that in the end is a mess. You can always go back to previous versions. Issues is a way of discussing when you there is a problem or something to improve, you can open an issue and you can have discussions there with people remotely or with your collaborators, etc. Or, or with yourself. It's like a can be used also as a task manager. I have to do this and this and this. And pull merge request is when you collaborate with other people and, and you synchronize them. Okay, I want to focus on, on I think the, the basics of uh, GitHub are easy. If not, just let me know. I want to talk about workflow management system. So the next step, I, I have talked about the basic things, how to set up more or less uh, the, the basic ingredients, have the software, have, but then you can orchestrate that much better with management systems. And in particular, I was explain Snake Make because I, it's like a Python version of Make, more or less, something like that. So the analysis. Analysis, as we saw, is you have some data sets, maybe, you have some processing, and then you have some results. Okay, you can do that by hand, the good thing is to try to automate automate this process because then it's scalable. When you have scalability, you can repeat this for not for one object, but for the hundreds or thousands of objects that we saw before. And then if this works, all the others most probably will work as well. There is another dimension, which is portability. All this needs to work uh, in the right place in your computer, in your collaborator computer, but also in a cluster. It has to work everywhere uh, where it's needed. So we have now all the ingredients, as I said before, the code repository with version control, the software and the data provenance, so where things are, which software to use, the documentation that can also be implemented in the same repository, and then you have your workflow. Workflow starts usually with data. You produce plots, tables, catalogs, notebooks, whatever you need, maybe also more data, usually more data is generated, and then finally the paper. So the workflow management systems allow you to to orchestrate all these all these uh, items and make them work um, uh, easily. So, well, why workflows? Uh, you can create these these workflows uh, easily. You can go from raw data to figures or paper automatically. It helps you when you do a workflow. It helps you to think in atomic steps. I want to do this, and I want to do another step independent from this one. Well, they are connected, but they are independent. So, when you need to change one step or in the future there's a new tool, you can just substitute that step or improve that step. It's, it's a good way to, it's more intuitive also for the logic of the analysis. You can run halfway through, for example, imagine that the first steps calibration or simulations are very intensive, but then the plots in the end, you want to iterate a lot, you want to run them many times. So you can also do that automatically with this. You can uh, manage parallelization uh, and basically the, the dependency of tasks and software, okay. So which workflow management uh, system to use? This is a list, this is quite funny. It's a list uh, that they keep in, in a repository from the common workflow language, which is, uh, as it says, a, a common language for, for workflows. And here you can see things that maybe sounds to you, Taverna, or you can see what is in here, make, snake make, 
Nextflow, Rufus, Luigi, these are all used in industry a lot. You have, have also Pegasus, also used in astronomy sometimes, Airflow. There are many options. Well, but when I mean many, there are many, many options. These are like 25, but you can scroll 50, 100, 200, 250, 300, 330. Recorded here, that, that probably there are more. So you have a lot of options, and I think I don't think this is good. <laughs> I think this is bad. <laughs> I explored some of them, and in the end, I decided, okay, I will go with Snake Make. I like how it produces things. I, it's very intuitive, so that's why I, I chose uh, Snake Make. Uh, so reasons: Snake Make is based on Python. Python is, for many astronomers, is a natural language. The most of astronomers know how to use Python and, and read Python. So you can use Python inside the definition of your workflow, which is very useful. Uh, you just not when you define the rules of these tasks or these jobs, you can include Python code to make it more, for example, the scalability. Uh, you can you can include lists or loops, things like that. I think it's easy to learn, although this is subjective. But I, the learning learning curve of the basic uh, things uh, is uh, easy. The scalability it very easily moves from working on a laptop to uh, working on multi-core servers, for example, using a slurm. It has functionality to, uh, to help with that. It's very easy to manage software because it has two options. You can do, use Conda environments. You just define Conda environment or a Singularity or a Docker container. Uh, and it will take care of all the... You don't need to install Conda. You don't need... Well, you need the dependencies to, to run Snake Make. But for the analysis, you don't need to, to install Conda, activate the environments, deactivate. You don't need to do any of those. It will be done automatically and per task. Each task can have its own independent environment. It has also tools to visualize the, the job flow and all these common tasks of parallelization, uh, moving files, creating files, all of that is, is automatically logging, benchmarking, all that is very easy. I just want to show this, this plot because I like it a lot. Uh, it's a plot from, from Snake Make. So here you see the reproducibility, but we want a bit more than we don't want just to reproduce a thing. We want to be able to adapt it because in the future you will adapt your workflows to work with other type of data or with other uh, in, in other topics. Transparency, so you understand what is going on, and all that creates the sustainability of the of the of your workflow. And then you have automation, scalability, portability, readability, traceability, and documentation. Right. It's just, I, I like the idea of, of all these concepts working together. So let's see some examples of a snake make, how it works. Um, all these workflow management systems in general uses uh, DAG, DAC. <coughs> this is direct acyclic uh, graphs to, to create the, the order of the jobs executed. I think the best is to think about input and output. Every job, every Every task that is executed as a job has input files and output files. And this defines how, how the workflow works. Here is a very simple example of a workflow to create a pea soup. If you want to do a soup, you need water and peas. With these two elements, you go to the next one, which is boil the peas. But you also need, in parallel, chopped vegetables. When you have the chopped vegetables, you create the proto soup, which is mixing everything. And then you create the pea soup. Every step has it, not all need input. The first one, the input is the vegetable itself, is chopping them. Uh, but always there should be an output, and then you have the concatenation. Here on the right, you have another example. It's much more complicated, and the files may be used in different steps. If you create a catalog, for example, maybe you need to read it for visualization, for analysis, for different parts. But in the end, everything ends in one final step, which is the usually the is called all in general but it's, it's the one that uh, closes the, this loop. It can be more complicated. Maybe you have a section with simulations or, or modeling, another with data reduction, and then at the end, they, you can combine them to create the PDF for the paper. It also, as I said, it can, a single task, you write a task in a snake maker called rules. You write a rule, but then you can uh, execute it on many input files, and then you will produce in parallel several output files. And then you can concatenate it. All this is, is orchestrated by Snake Make. And then you can go crazy and do things like that. I have absolutely no idea what <laughs> this is doing, but at least it's recorded and it's documented. That's the important thing. And every file goes to where it needs to be to do the next step. And everything can be can have a, a meaning. Okay, let's see actual code from Snake Make. In Snake Make, usually you create a, a Snake file. 
in make you create make files in a snake make you create snake files okay and this is a series of definition of rules one rule is each of these nodes basically here you have imagine a text a plain text file uh, european countries .txt with a list of countries netherlands greece spain so your rule you give it a name which is count countries this is just informative it is giving information this is going to count the number of countries okay the input that file european countries uh, .txt. the output will be also a file which is called number of countries so this will be a file which will contain a number with a number of countries okay that's fine and then the command or the execution to produce the output from the input this is just the shell command wc word count and it, it takes that file and it writes the result in that file you can simplify this because these names are also already defined there so you can do input output and it is easier Okay, uh, as you said, you saw before the lines, the arrows, sometimes there are multiple arrows coming in or coming out from the nodes. So for example, you can uh, set a list of inputs. You can also define that in when you want to parallelize, this may be a list or a function that generates a list of outputs so you can parallelize it. Um, and then the key is to concatenate. The output from that rule that we just saw is number of countries. And the next rule, which is preprocessing, I don't know why it's called that, uses this as an input. So the output of that one is the input of that. So you have the, the graph like that. And this is how SnakeMake knows what is the order that you need to apply. Okay, there are more information that you can put in the rule. This is called directives. Uh, you can use a conda directive. So uh, you have a YAML file and the SnakeMake will create the conda environment, will execute this line with that software specifically. Maybe the next rule uses a different one. And maybe the next one uses a Docker container because your collaborator sent a Docker container and, and it's, you can use it. So you can combine software, different versions, different um, approaches. Uh, for example, here, how to use a container. It can be from Docker Hub, from uh, Singularity Hub, or it can be in, a, in other places. And there are additional things to help. Uh, that's why I like this name, because it has some functionality that helps uh, for, for specific purposes. For example, the input, can be also remote files. Maybe it's a file that is in the node, and it, this is very simple, but in the end, it helps you retrieve the data and put it in the right place. Um, what else? The outputs, uh, you can define, for example, temporary files. Imagine that one of these steps is creating huge files and you don't want to keep them. When, when SnakeMake follows all the track of the inputs and outputs and knows that you are not going to use it anymore, it can delete it automatically or ensure the checksum or create directories, etc. The execution, you can uh, execute shell scripts, uh, well, shell commands, but also scripts in Python, Julia, uh, Rust, I think everything, or bash scripts or notebooks also. And you can launch these rules locally in your computer or in the cloud, in Kubernetes, uh, Slurm, MPI, many other things. So there, there are all these tools that make your life easier sometimes. And then there are many other things that you can add, for example, log. So everything is locked. So all the output is locked in a file. Benchmark which tells you how many CPUs and memory have you used. Uh, report, it can generate also an HTML report. I don't like it very much, but well, there is the possibility to do that. I prefer to create a, 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 latte, a PDF yourself. Parameters, uh, limit the resources that you need to use, the CPUs that you need to use, give it priority. Well, there are, there are many things, but the basic ones are the, the ones we talked before. If um, <clears throat> this is a bit separate, that, that's the basic fu uh, function of Snake Make. There is this web page, uh, I think it's, it's interesting to know, it's called Show Your Work, which is designed for uh, Snake Make is general purpose, and this is more to produce a research paper. So the output is always an ms.pdf, uh, a manuscript PDF. So it has some additional things. Uh, for example, it, uh, it can store files in Zenodo and retrieve it from Zenodo, so you can use it as an archive. Um, you can, it has integration with Overleaf. It can also prepare the archive submission. It can, there's a nice thing that when in the PDF, it will put an icon in each figure. And if you click in that, uh, it's a link. If you click in that link, it will point to the repository, to the commit, and to the file that produced that, uh, that uh, figure in particular. So if you're reading the paper, you click there and you know exactly what was the notebook or the script that produced the, the plot. You just need to do a few more things, like for example, in the LaTeX file, include a script, which script produce this, uh, this plot, so then it knows where to find things. So I think it's a nice option, especially if you want to 
to have like a this is like, like a template. Everything is prepared. You just need to work on the LaTeX and 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 the scripts, and it works. I don't like it very much because because it's a, it's a template. It has a format, and you need to follow it. Uh, I prefer to run it myself, but uh, if you're interested, you can also take a look. Let's let's do a quick example. <clears throat> I prepared. Um, okay, I prepared this. Can you read it well? <laughs> Oof. Okay, it's a repository is called example snake make here, which uh, basically is a workflow that uh, uses snake make. Uh, here there is some uh, documentation. As always, I said, write a readme with the documentation how to use it. I will open this binder. Let's see if it works like uh, local execution. This is basically how to install snake make, and the execution is actually this one. Uh, this is the workflow description. It's very easy. It will take a data cube from the paper we also showed yesterday, I think, um, from uh, Mike Jones' paper uh, 2019 on the Hickson Compact Group 16. It will download a cube, data cube. It will run a script to create the moment zero using a spectral cube on AstroPy tool. And then it will run a script to create a figure, a PNG, from that uh, moment zero. And then it will compile the paper. Um, well, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's just straightforward. Download data, create moment zero, plot moment zero, um, and write and render the paper. That's that's uh, everything that it does. Here, there is an example of the concatenation of files, the input and output. Download data doesn't have an input file. It just can run and download the data, and that's it. The output from this is the input from the next one. The output from this is the input of the next one, etc. So, if I show you the workflow, the snake make file, which is Basically, this concatenation of rules. Well, you, you have the configuration file. The rule all, which is the final product, is going to be the paper PDF. The download data has an output, has a command to produce that output. The create moment has input, which is the previous output. And then uh, it creates the fits file with this code environment and running this Python script. The next one gets the fits and produces a PNG with this code environment and with this Python script. So everything is, and then the LaTeX file, uh, the, the, it uses Tectonic because it's very simple to, to install and, and use. Um, so let's look at the workflow. For example, in environments, I just have three uh, YAML files. The moment zero one uses Python, NumPy, AstroPy, SciPy, Spectral Group. That's it. Uh, the plot feeds has other dependencies in this particular example. For example, Matplotlib and another version of Python. And then the scripts are simple, simple Python scripts like uh, this is for plotting, and the other one is to create the moment zero. So it's basically if you now you have two, a couple of or, or more scripts, and you want to concatenate them in in certain order, it's very you see it's very easy to to write the snake make uh, a snake file to to concatenate those those examples. So let's quickly run it so you see a, an actual execution. I will let me see here. I will uh, git clone this repository. Okay, I go into it, for example. And here you have the same files I, I just showed you. Mm, well, you need to, I, I already have um, Conda installed and I created a snake make environment following the instructions in the readme. So it's already set up. So I can directly go snake make. Uh, this is to say how many cores do you want to use because it's only one task sequentially. It's one, with one is enough, and I need to say that I need to use Conda. Okay, now it's building the DIG, the the, the graph, and now it's creating the environments. So it's creating the Conda environment from this uh, YAML file. So it knows that at some point it will need to use that Conda environment. So it's creating all of them at the beginning. So that takes a bit. Uh, well, it will take a couple of minutes. In the meantime, maybe I can show you the config file. In this case, I only put a parameter in the config uh, YAML file, which is the location of the data cube, which is this uh, is in CDS. But in general, it would be good to have configuration files for all the parameters that you use in the scripts. It's a bit a good practice to keep the script as uh, as plain as possible. That doesn't depend on, on specific data sets, 
and all the parameters that are moved to parameters file. So that way you can reuse your code with other files just by changing the parameters in that file. So it's usually good here. I didn't do that, but it's a, it's a good practice. Let's see. It's downloading and installing packages. Yeah, it will take a couple of minutes. Let me show you something else. So in the end, it's good to have a license. Uh, I will, um, we'll also talk about that uh, a bit later, and there is a talk later. So uh, you need to, to basically explain what is this that doing and how to make it run. This, uh, I think it's important. OK, now no, this is taking a bit long. OK, now I think it's finishing. This is the last. Uh, there are three environments, so it's created. This only, only needs to happen once, once you have the the um, environments you don't need to create them again unless you change the yaml file okay if there is any question while this uh, finishes it will be one minute or so anyone has a question up to now quickly are yeah. you creating an environment inside oh, yeah. i should have known that better yeah are you creating an environment inside the conda environment i don't really get that um, well, yeah, you are working on a content environment, and and the other one is is managed by a snake make. So it will create. In fact, is it creates in a dot snake mail directory uh, this environment. So in general, it's not easy easy to access it, but it's inside the the snake make uh, structure. So yeah, yeah, you are creating one inside the other. Yeah. So that's only accessible to snake mail or yes. the packages that are inside. Yeah. You can also activate if I do a cond activate and copy this. It will activate them. Okay, so here there is the summary of the jobs. These are all the jobs that need to be executed. Total five. We are not using multi-threading, so that's one thread per 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 task. And here it says the first rule: download data, and this is what it's doing: downloading the data. The next one, this is finished. Twenty percent of the pipeline is done. The next one is create the moment zero. The next one is plot the moment zero, and the last one is uh, work with uh, the PDF, create the PDF. So basically, just git clone and running the snake make uh, command, if you have a snake make installed and everything, of course, um, produces the results publication paper. Okay, you have here, this is empty content, uh, it's just a placeholder, and, and then you have the plot here. Now imagine that you want to go to modify something in the, in the scripts. You go to workflow, scripts, plot, and now maybe you're a bit crazy and instead of using a color palette like a Viridis, which is good, you use something awful like Jet, because who knows why. And now when I run a snake make again, it will evaluate, let me do it a dry run with minus N, it will not run anything. It will, it will just show what is going to, to happen. It evaluates what's in there. And now it doesn't need to download the data. It doesn't need to create the moment zero. It will only, plot the moment zero and create the, the text, the PDF. Because I only changed the script that was produced in the plot. So only the plot and everything that comes after that will be rerun, okay? I will take the minus N and then here the plot should be updated. Okay, now you see the paper has, is updated and I, as name I will make sure that everything is up to date. Okay, so this this is the example. I, I don't, don't need to show anything else. And sorry, the version control is it automatic? Um, because you updated the paper, so you get a different version with a different patch. Um, well, now it, I just modified the, the files. Now, if I want to commit, that well, I need to add the files that I want to add, commit them, and then I may push it to the repository to have the latest version. Okay. So let's finish. Let's finish this. Just uh, I wanted to show an example, a quick, a quick example. This is not only for papers. For example, the SK Data Challenge Two. We participated with the High Friends team, and we wrote a pipeline, a workflow uh, with a Snake Make. Uh, well, you have already heard about the data challenges. We were participating in 2021 in the analysis of a data cube, simulated data cube for an SKA. It's a one terabyte data cube. And there, there was this challenge to find the sources, H1 sources in the in this cube. So this is the graph of the, um, because it was a very big cube, uh, we were uh, slicing it in smaller chunks and then uh, working in parallel and then concatenating the solutions and finally visualize, creating a catalog and then visualizing it. 
uh, here is the, as I said, the, the links between the input and output files of this one. And if zooming in this region, you can see that the final catalog required like a file that is called unfiltered catalog. And then it was doing operations to, to create the final catalog. And then everything went to the visualize and we could create uh, PNGs, uh, Python notebooks and all the, all the things to, to, to check and to verify the, the final. And the final output is basically the catalog, the Python notebook and, and image. This is, this is, I think this is very important, not specifically for SnakeMeg or not specifically for this, uh, this uh, solution, the, the workflow, but it's very important that you think ahead before, before you start an analysis, the structure of the files that you are going to use and going to need. For example, here the workflow is organized. There is a SnakeMeg file, and then there are directories. The environments directory contains all the content environments that we were using. The notebooks, all the templates for the notebooks. The rules, this is the snake make rules. Uh, they are divided in files by, for organization, but uh, it's basically what I showed you the rules. And the scripts, the Python scripts that we were using. Everything is in the right place and also define the output and results. Here we created um, a resource, uh, folders for catalogs, for logs, for notebooks, plots, and the Sophia auto. Sophia is the software that was processing the, the small cubes. So uh, here on the right, you can see the logs. Inside the logs uh, directory, there are also directories for each of the rules, uh, like concatenate, uh, run Sophia, Sophia to catalog, split. And then inside there were logs for all the jobs that were executed, including the, um, uh, here there are only four uh, parallel executions, but in the actual, we, we, we used, I think, 36. Uh, and, and you have the logs all organized in the right place and you know where to find. I think this helps a lot when you're thinking on the structure, think about the structure of the files also. And also the documentation. I said before that uh, for the paper, maybe it's enough to have a readme file or several readme files as many as much as possible. You can also document the code. You can also document the parameters file, etc. But when you are doing larger projects, it's good to have a documentation. <coughs> the documentation can be developed in the in the repository. In the code repository, you can write uh, documentation. I recommend also using Markdown files because Markdown files can be rendered, for example, in a web page like this. Uh, so this is using read the docs. It's a pay uh, uh, service, online service that uh, you can use to generate full uh, web pages uh, synchronized with your repository. So if you're in your repository, you update the, the, the documentation, automatically this web page will be also be automated. And here you can put things like the description, methodology, workflow description, installation, dependencies, etc. Cetera, et cetera. This is useful when you have projects that are a bit larger. Developers documentation, you can also synchronize that. Um, some open science related files. It, they are not actually standard, but you, you should have some files in your, in your repository. For example, the citation. The citation file, there's a standard format that machines can read uh, to make easy to, for people to cite your work. Not only the paper, or it can be the paper directly, but also the workflow. Uh, code of con uh, conduct and contributing is if you want people to, to contribute to your repository, the license, you will hear more about that, the readme. And then there are these batches, which are basically because it's maybe fun. Um, it, it's some standard because you know that when there is the, the DOI batch, this is a link to, for example, the Zenodo or, or, or wherever you are storing the, the repository or keeping it. If there is a docs, uh, you can directly go to the documentation. If you launch binder, you can directly open a binder. So these batches are easy to implement in Markdown in the README file and, and gives you some, well, it's, it's, it's funny to implement this. You can set the license, for example, here with the batch of the particular license that you are using. And in binder, uh, Manu this, uh, Manu Parra, Manuel Parra this afternoon will talk more about binder. To make it interoperable, uh, what we did was, okay, you can install SnakeMake as we, as we show in the, in the demo. Uh, run a snake, a snake make and execute it, it will, and, and it will do the thing. But to make it more general, we also created, uh, thanks to Manuel Parra, the Docker container, Singularity container, Fortman container. We use a tarball in which we put all the software that was downloaded, so it's available there. That means that you don't need internet connection in principle to, to install, or if the Conda servers are down and you cannot download the, the software, you can still do, uh, have it here. So if you have this tar file, you have everything you need in particular for Linux, uh, and also you can run it in my binder. So it, it's, it can be executed in different platforms. 
Uh, we store it in Zenodo, in Workflow Hub, and also uh, you heard the, the other day, Software Heritage also is synchronized. Uh, you have seen this, this plot a, a couple of time at, times at least. Uh, there was the reproducibility uh, part of the challenge. Uh, we were the team that won the gold, the gold award, uh, the only one that uh, obtained the gold award because we were following all the, all the checklist, all the items in this checklist to make sure that the workflow was reproducible. So it's well documented, easy to install, easy to use, license uh, accessible uh, with the standards and with testing. And thanks very much to Laura Arriba who worked on making sure that all this checklist was successfully applied and, and implemented. So I think it's, it's nice that, uh, well, I will, I will tell you more about that later. So conclusions, I think this is the most important part of the talk. What can you do now, uh, this afternoon, tomorrow, with your research to make it more reproducible? First, start by the beginning, first things first. Just simply, if you, uh, don't put pressure on yourself, just start documenting. That's fundamental. Write readme's files, uh, document the code. When you write a function, say what it's doing, what it needs, and what it, uh, what's uh, the output. Use version control, software repositories. GitHub is very easy, GitLab is very easy, others are also very easy. Git is a bit more complicated, but the basics you can also learn in, in a few days. Okay. Please move from manual to automatic. You cannot make things reproducible if they are manual. Imagine you are clicking a hundred times in different places. You cannot document uh, clicking this pixel and then move to the other pixel uh, is, is, is not. Most of the research analysis tools have a version that doesn't need to be clicking uh, in different parts. So try to implement that if possible. Uh, again, try to separate code from parameters and also code and parameters from data. Everything should be kept uh, separately. And then sh share your work. Don't be afraid to, to put your work in Zenodo, uh, Workflow Hub in, in other, in other um, uh, places so other people can access and can uh, help you improve or maybe find the problems. That's, that's also what uh, how science works. Uh, sometimes we make mistakes. And the important thing is that the mistakes are not hidden somewhere that nobody will reach. The mistakes should be visible so we can fix them. Okay, another thing that you can do is follow this checklist. There are many checklists. This is quite complete. As um, uh, someone said uh, yesterday, is maybe it's a bit, uh, uh, there are too many things, but I think it's good to have this reference. So check the list, assess your own skills and say, okay, I can do this and I can do that. And maybe I can learn that because I have been interested in for a long time to do that. So I will learn. And this is a guide to, to start doing things. There are three levels, the bronze, the silver and the gold. I start with the bronze. And, and make sure that you can execute uh, them and then check if uh, other things or you or your collaborators can help with you with that. So you don't need to make everything uh, completely, but uh, this is a guide to, to start doing things. Then get inspired. If you want to, to don't, don't start from, from the beginning and create your own thing. Uh, for example, here there is the Snake Make Workflow Catalog. There are 2,200 work, workflows of people that have already created workflows. You can go there and check them. In particular, there are 155 that are standardized, that use the best practices to create those workflows and are completely reproducible. You can go there and see, even if it's from another other fields, you can see how people stru structure things, the files, how is this uh, file, etc. So it's a, it can be an inspiration to, to decide. And also get inspired by papers. In particular, look for papers with repositories. If you are interested in a paper, look in GitHub, look in GitLab, or in Google in general, and see if they have a repository and if it's reproducible or not. Here is the, well, Mike Jones paper, which is very good. Uh, this is the one I showed you before. And this one, this one is interesting. I, I like how they organize the code and, and how you can reproduce the, the analysis with the code that, that they have. And of course, virtually all the papers from Mohammed, they are reproducible, I think, by default. <laughs> so you can, you can go there and, and get also inspired by uh, how to use manage, uh, etc. So uh, see how other people are doing things. So message. ReproHax, this is an initiative. It's a community-driven um, events where people get together and then they share their own work. So I have a paper, I send it to you, and you send it, uh, your paper to me, and we try to reproduce it. And if we have problems, we can give feedback and improve the solution. So usually it's a few hours of people just meeting and discussing how they are doing things, et cetera. So it, it's nice. There are several events per year. And also interestingly, there is um, a, paper, a list of papers to review. There are, I don't know, 80 or 100 or something. Else. So you can also put your paper there, and other people will try to reproduce it, and if 
they cannot do it, maybe you get feedback and then you can improve. So it's a good, it's a good place also to get some inspiration. And I finish here. Uh, so there are some time for questions, etc. There are resources here. Let me just quickly say the Snake Make documentation, of course, is very complete and it's very nice. Uh, here we had uh, two events at the Institute, the Open Science Droplets, which have, uh, uh, if you need more information, for example, on GitLab, Git, uh, notebooks, uh, things like that, the reprodu reproducibility course that we also uh, uh, had here at the IAA. And then there are, well, the Turing Way, of course, uh, Rachel talked about that yesterday. And then there are also links to some reproducibility course. MVs, is, they work on bioinformatics, but they do very good uh, tutorials and information. Uh, creating executable paper. This is a paper for nature. Um, some more information on snake, snake make, uh, fair. We, we haven't talked about fair, but the, the final conclusion is that all this makes your research uh, fair because uh, what you do, you put it online, it's, uh, you can find it, you can access it, you can execute it, you can reproduce it. In the end, it's reusable. Um, when you do this, uh, reproducibility triggers that the FAIR principles are, are satisfied. So that's all. Uh, I will send you the presentation so you have all the links. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. Lovely. We have time for, yeah, one question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so there's obviously a big push to get things automated because that's how we can make things reproducible. What's your advice to people who feel like, you know, I mean, I, I've noticed a lot in, in radio astronomy, especially a lot of people like to get hands-on and manual with their data, especially during data reduction and things. How, like, what's your advice to people to kind of let that go and, and trust the automated process. Yeah, it's completely fine. It's, I think you need to get the routines. As I said before, uh, it's completely normal to make uh, exploratory analysis by hand. We all do that and it's needed because you need to play with things. But then you need to remember always to, to, to make the next step is once you're finished, uh, synthesize what you did and write a command line, a script, something that can reproduce that. Maybe it takes some time. It takes uh, you need to try a few a few times, but it's very important because you, then you need to do it once, because sometime in the future you will need to the files will be lost, or something will be changed, or you have a new method that you want to apply and you will need to repeat, and then you will say, <laughs> "Pass me was <laughs> very lazy." So I, I think it's worth uh, depending on the software is more difficult or not, but uh, I think uh, the classic example you are exploring the web or or the um, I don't know uh, BCR and you download something and you click download. And you have the file. Okay, then if that's the file that you really need, spend some time on getting a wgit uh, command that can retrieve it or an astropy query that can retrieve it. Because then you have done once, you don't need to do it any anymore in your life. That particular step. Thank you. Um, I think it's really. I I just I'm really envious of all of the PhD PhD students in particular who are learning these skills now because when you come back to write up your thesis, this is really really handy. You know to so that it's already automated for what you did in year one. Yeah, I must say that I'm very ashamed of my PhD <laughs> analysis. So I, it would be difficult to, to replicate everything and to reproduce everything now. It will take a lot of effort to do it. Uh, thank you. Just a comment to add on, on your point, uh, on Rachel's uh, question, that never trust automation. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> automation is good. Uh, it's necessary. We have to do automation, but never trust. Uh, because I mean, I, I'm so frustrated by people that just press enter, they get a plot and they don't actually sample, uh, you know, visually a few of like, say, the say they're looking at galaxy sizes, for example, and then, you know, sample a few points from your final results and actually look at the images visually as a human, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, to, to see if your analysis, you didn't make a funny mistake and, uh, you know, um, something went completely wrong and you don't see it in the plots, but if you look at the images, you see it. Mm -hmm. So this is an important point, uh, exactly mm -hmm. what you said. It's important to first check everything. Once you're done, then automate. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. There is something else, it's not completely related, but I want to emphasize it. When you do a workflow like this for all your research, and, and I, I said that you need to, to check your scope and what you want to do, sometimes you have to think who is going to reproduce this. And sometimes people don't want to reproduce from the first bit to the last bit. 
sometimes they just want to see that parameter or that function or what you used or which package you use and don't lose too much much time if you don't have the skills don't lose too much time to try to get everything reproducible the key parts are the important are the first one that you need to make reproducible maybe the final plots or the or the critical analysis that contains the science the physics on the analysis that you are doing that's what what you and other people would like to check specifically if you can do everything do everything but for example raw data sometimes is very difficult to get Mercat data after some time don't just don't know the data can take a month you need an account you need to log in you can request it and it, it can take a month just to retrieve the data nobody is going to run the pipeline to, and wait one month until you have the data so focus on the important parts first which are the analysis and the physics any other question either here or online uh, i don't know if marcos can you check it okay we have about um, four or five minutes left. So if there are any questions, we can take them now. One question that I, one thing that I was thinking about, and this is something that um, I was talking to Muhammad about uh, during um, the uh, during the tea um, the tea break. What would you um, what would be your um, your point on or your advice on? Um, some of the tasks that cannot be automated. For example, uh, let's say, and this is a very common use, uh, um, common case, eh? where you have a graphic interface um, uh, GUI that there are some important work that you do on the GUI that you cannot, in no way, you cannot do it um, in the terminal automatically. So these are some of the way, um, I, I think it's a kind of dead, dead end because there is no way you can reproduce yeah. that. You can do that um, automatically. So you do you have any advice or anything well, on that? You need to do something. So at least I would say, if you can explain it, explain it as detailed as possible, exactly what you did. Uh, so at least you can someone you or someone can follow the steps and try to repeat it. If even if that is difficult, so uh, what you can do is if you work manually, you produce an output, save that output and put it in in a repository so people can download it, and at least they can. They can continue the analysis exactly from the point you did it. At least the information is not lost. It's not the best, but at least it works, and, and people will be able to complete the analysis with all the information. Yeah, Susanna. Since we have some minutes left, I would like to to ask something related to what uh, Mahamad said. So we are, if you are not going to trust in the automation process what we are going to do when the SK data came and you need to <laughs> process uh, a lot of data sets, thousands. I don't know how many sources we found in the simulated data in the SK data challenge too. So at some point you need or create other processes in order to check what has been done by the automation process. I don't know <laughs> what do you think. There are uh, different ways. One is like unit tests. You create data sets that you know what's in there. And then at the end of the process, you should recover with a certain, with some uncertainty, but you should recover the same results. That's can test, but you cannot test all the possible scenarios, of course, but at least the software should work in those cases and you can make it them as complicated as you want. It's a kind of similar to the SK data challenges. In the end, you simulate something and, and then you see if you can retrieve, if, the, if your software is trustful enough that you can retrieve the what you put inside the cube. But, uh, but yeah, it, of course it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, it's important. <clears throat> I showed that uh, we were, for example, uh, there was a big task on visualization. It's important to visualize things, to correlate things, to, to see distributions. To you, do, you will not need individual need to look at individual objects, but the distribution should be follow, following the expected behavior. So if something is not right, maybe that is, that is, that is telling you that something was wrong in the, in the process. But yeah, it's difficult, of so course. Do you think that we do, do you need new tools in order to review the results of this automated process in yeah. another things, thing? things like As LSST, yeah. LS, review? in the end, machine learning is going to be, the machines are going to do the, the hard work. We, we need to supervise what they do, but uh, at large scale, machine learning and artificial intelligence will help with this, of course. 